Okay, I've got a lot of junk on there. You know, I tell all my students that you get a lot of names, little things after your name. The reason I'm putting it up here is I want you to understand I'm an engineer, okay? I really enjoyed all this astrobiology and all this stuff, but I'm an engineer. You know, I can prove that because I got a pen in my pocket, okay? <laughs> okay, so now we've got that under thing. What I'm going to claim is that I can build a space elevator and be operational by 38. Now, we can talk about how later. We're not going to talk about that today. What we're going to talk about today is why. Why are we doing space elevators? The answer is very simple. Okay? It's very simple. Now, what we're trying to do is use something other than stinking rocket equation. I've been here two days, and everybody talks about, holy Toledo, we can't get anything to space. I looked up Voyager, 815 kilograms. Then I looked up the weight of the, trying to remember the stupid rocket, uh, whatever it was. I looked up the weight of it, and it was 99.9% .9 of the total mass of the system on the pad was used up to get to Voyager's capability to leave. That's downright stupid. I tell all my students that the rocket equation is the stupidest thing going, and that's true. Now, it's the only way to do our business, okay? And I've launched satellites, I've operated satellites, I track satellites, I got all that. I love rockets. I, I was Apollo 12. I got. The, I love rockets, but it's really a stupid idea. I mean, really think about it a little bit. So what we want to do is we have a long string, 100,000 kilometers long. Oh, well, in our case, we want to go interstellar, so we wanted 163,000 kilometers long. Rotation of the Earth, long arm, go fast, release, no fuel required, you leave the solar system. Think about that. No fuel required, you leave the solar system. Now, I want to put it in perspective. That's only half of the beauty. Everybody's thought about this, you know, that looks at space elevators. Yeah, we can go real fast, go up, go fast. Nobody until about six months ago even considered the other aspect of it, except that all of you have seen it. Star Trek building the Enterprise. Where do you think that is outside the Earth? Let's ignore anti-gravity, okay? Let's, where do you think you put it? You put it at the end of a tether well above the gravity well, so it doesn't even, it's not affected by gravity. So it's got an outward acceleration of about two-tenths of a G. You can put a wrench down that stays there. You can operate and assemble things at 100,000 kilometers in altitude. Wait a minute, what does that do for you? It eliminates the rocket equation. Shall I mention that again? eliminates the rocket equation. So what we want to do is create a revolution here. Now, just to put it in perspective so you guys understand, it's really long. <laughs> okay, it's outside the bow shock. So my electrodynamics uh, expert from Lawrence Livermore, my vice president of our organization, has looked at that and said, oh, no problem. We will not short out the ionosphere. Okay, there are lots of little questions that we haven't answered. We're still trying to answer these questions, but the revolution is so beneficial to our life in the future, we must do space elevators. And I'm here to tell you we can. Now, we've got a lot of issues. Okay, if you want to talk about that, we can talk. But, but I believe you can do it. Uh, they're ready to go into engineering development where the green road to space. Oh, did I mention we don't burn any rocket fuel in the atmosphere? and we don't leave any debris in these orbits. We have a report, if anybody wants to go to the website, we got a report that does the green road to space and talks about all that kind of stuff. So we have strengths that are really amazing. So we get up really high and we move tremendous mass. What can we do? Okay, well, our plan is we're gonna have commercial competition here. This is not a government program. We believe that you can make trillions of dollars with the new business of lifting stuff without using a rocket. Now, we gotta have rockets to go in low Earth orbit. We can't do low Earth orbit. And we really wanna go fast through radiation belts, so we gotta have rockets for people. But why are you lifting heavy mass 
with stinking rockets. Who said stinking rockets? Anyway, so that's our mass movement over there. When we get going and get operational, we'll do 170,000 tons per year. Now, wait a minute. Up to 19, or 2023, we had only put 26,000 tons in orbit. So we're going to put a lot more than that into orbit per year. And why is that? Because we get rid of the rocket equipment. Did I say that again? Anyway, uh, the kicker is we just published in the British Interplanetary Society five articles on space elevators. I did not create this image here, and I did not put the words on the cover, but it says right there, we have the technology. Now, I don't know if you guys know anything about the British Interplanetary Society, but they've been a lot around a long time. Started with Arthur C. Clarke and went from there. So, you know, we have really a lot of history here, and they kind of say we can do it. So I thought, okay, well, let's do that. Well, we've got the geo region. We go up to geo, we build a satellite, we let it float around. Man, oh man, that's pretty simple, right? You can take up mass initially at 14 metric tons a trip. Later on, when we get two tethers together and all that, we get 79 tons per uh, trip per day. Take stuff up and assemble at a geo. Well, how about assemble at the apex anchor? Okay, so now let's take Voyager. I'm going to use that as an example. 815 kilograms. We took uh, how many years to get out there? Uh, 46 years to get out there. You're going to see my math in a little bit. We can get to 100 AU in seven or in nine years. We're already in interstellar in nine years. If you go to the top of the space elevator and release. Oh, by the way, when you get to the top of the space elevator, you want to kind of like gain the speed, but you also want to have your Star Trek assembly plant. Now think about rockets. If I want to assemble something, I use 99% of the mass to take it up to the orbit around the moon. Okay, You can get about a 1% to the orbit of the moon. You get a half a percent to the surface of the moon. So you get 1% of the mass on the pad to going around the moon, and you build a gateway. Why don't you build the gateway up there and release it? Now, you'd have to slow it down when you get to the moon after 14 hours. From that top, with the velocity, you'd be in the moon in 14 hours. So you'd have to have some motors to slow it. As I said, I love rockets. Just not to get out of the gravity well. That's a kicker. It's that gravity well that's a bear. I uh, do some teaching, or not really full teaching. I go in and advise some of my friends that are teaching space system engineering. And this one friend had a year-long capstone senior level class designing spacecraft going to Mars human spacecraft going to Mars, kind of like a mini course to go interstellar. So this was 100 tons. It's got a rotating habitat. It's got nuclear power and nuclear propulsion. 100 tons. Let's take that vehicle, multiply it times 100 times, and build it at the apex anchor. And let's say 9 tenths of it is nuclear propulsion. I can leave the solar system real easy. I can be going really fast by the time I get there. The point is, this revolution opens up so many opportunities for humans to exploit. We can go fast, we can assemble it at above the gravity well, and we can go anywhere we want. When you get, get really going, you can get all the way out to Neptune in like 100 days, something like that. So you can really get some velocity. And the way you do that, and that's the reason why I get this silly thing here. You know, I hadn't used this yo-yo in 30 flipping years. I had to practice before I came. <laughs> I mean, this, this is a nice little tool to show everybody what a tether is. But I had to practice. It was horrible. Anyway, uh, we've got a Professor Pete at the Arizona State University that works with us. And he came up with a methodology of using mechanical devices rotating where you can double the velocity at, at the apex anchor using mechanical devices. So we can go twice as fast as we would if we were just climbing up to the top. So here's a diagram. It, you know, I taught orbits for a while. I should know this stuff. It took me a while to figure it out. It just, my brain wasn't working that well. Anyway, 
To leave the sun system to go interplanetary, I mean interstellar, you got to have 42 kilometers per second. Well, the Earth's already going 30, so you got an advantage. You take away 30. Now you need 12.35. Well, if you take us tether 163,000 kilometers up, which is the, the height we were talking about, you get 12.35. So you leave the solar system with no fuel. And then if you put Professor Pete's little mechanical devices on the end, you get another 10. And then we do some gravity assist. I looked at Voyager and they got a 15 kilometers per second addition going around, I think it was Neptune. Anyway, one of those planets. So let's do, do two of those to make that 30. So we can be going in excess of 25 kilometers per second when we leave the solar system. Voyager is going about four. No, I guess it's 12. Voyager is going 12, so we're going double that. So the point is, there's a revolution at hand and a capability to do things, but we've got to pursue it and we've got to work on it because we have so many opportunities. Now, why is this so strange? Because you've seen it before. You've gotten on a train before. You've gotten on buses. What do we have when we do a transportation system? Oh, commercial, routine, safe, permanent. Now ask yourself, do rockets fulfill any of those? I love rockets. Remember, I love rockets. But let's not use rockets to get out of the gravity well unless we need people to go fast through the radiation belts or unless we want to fill the low Earth orbit you know, region, which is very good for a lot of reasons. Yeah, but for, you know, going, getting out of the gravity well, why are you doing that? So I call it the conundrum of rockets. Why are we using a stinking system that gives us 4% to LEO, 2% to GEO, and 1% to around the moon and Mars and half a percent to the surface? I mean, think about that a little bit. Here's a picture to help you. Apollo put one half of 1% of the mass on the pad on the surface and only one quarter of that back to the ocean surface. Our business is hard. Rockets and spacecraft is hard. It's really fun though. Don't, I mean, tell all your kids and everything that it's a great uh, career. It is really a hoot to be in the space business. But that's a bummer. Man, I don't know how to better explain it. It really is a bummer. So the rocket equation can be thrown away for moving mass out of the gravity well if we have space elevators. Now, there are all kinds of other ideas that people come up with, and they keep telling me they've got great ideas and everything else. And I agree with them that, you know, anti-gravity is really good. If you come up with that, I'll jump on board. Man, I'm ready. Anything to get out of the gravity well. So what we came up with is transformational characteristics of what a stinking space elevator provides. Now, I don't know if you guys have been in an arena where nobody has a flipping clue what's going on. Okay, that's called research out there on the edge, and you guys are doing a lot of that in a lot of areas, but I do it in engineering terms in the sense of let's get out of the gravity well. We just came up with the term, and it, by the way, there was an hour and, a half to, hour and a half discussion in the car while I was driving home after golf. Unmatched efficiency. We had never really thought about it in a quantitative sense. So all of a sudden we're saying, we can do things like 70% of the mass on the pad we can get to geosynchronous and the apex anchor. And the other 30% is our tethered climber we reuse. So it really could be claimed as 100%. So that's a heck of a lot better than 2%. So it's unmatched efficiency, unmatched velocity. You go to 163,000 kilometers and there's not a rocket in the world that can get to that velocity that close to the Earth. Unless you have no payload. <laughs> if you had no payload, you could probably get there. Uh, and then we have the assembly at the top of the gravity well. That really had not been talked about for the last 20 years of space elevator development. We really had not exploited the idea of Star Trek. And all of a sudden, Star Trek comes up in our mind and we say, oh, we can assemble up there. That's radical. So there are really two characteristics that blow your mind when you really start thinking about it. Velocity, and you can raise as much mass as you want and assemble it above the gravity well. 
no stinking gravity. Well, it's one over r squared times 100,000 kilometers squared down and it really makes a difference. And then this one, we did a report in our organization on Green Road to Space. I thought that was a good one. Really talked about various missions. I'm gonna go through these charts, I only have two minutes left. Anyway, rocket strength, space elevator strength. This is a report we're doing right now. I have it in my car. I've gotta read it when I get back as a final edition, but that report's gonna be fun. And then if we think about developing it as a full system globally, commercially competitive, it really makes a lot of sense. Okay, we did a study at ASU and we call it the transportation story of the 21st century. And the students came up with a bunch of stuff. Now here's a concept I want you to think about. A bus schedule. Now, I've been in the rocket business forever, and I never had a rocket launch on time. Never did. Now, the rule in the U.S. is we launch when ready, and that's brilliant. It really is good, because you don't want to launch before you're ready. Why did the Russians launch? I, I had a Russian launch go a week early. We were going to go over and observe it so we could get our iridium satellites over there. And the doggone thing launched a week early and they canceled our visa because, you know, it was a week early. We don't do a week early. We don't have a bus schedule. If we have these dudes up there, we can have a bus schedule to space. We can do massive tonnage. I mean, really, that blows your mind. Transportation infrastructure. Why can we go to Mars so fast? Oh, by the way, we can be there in 61 days. Because we cut the corner, we're really going fast. Now, we, uh, this is another thing nobody knows about. We can release toward Mars every day of the year. Wait, wait a minute. Rockets have once every 26 months. Why is that? Alignment of the planet so you can do the minimum energy transfer. I remember that. I taught that. What we can do is release every day because we've got excess velocity. Now, some trips will be 400 days. So we said rocket, I mean, hammers and nails here. Some will be 61 days, that's pizza, send pizza. <laughs> okay, so why do we need to do this? It's simple, we must. Humanity must do space elevators. Now I haven't applied this to interstellar yet, but if we get a big assembly at a high altitude and give it large velocity with huge nuclear engines on top of it, all ready to go inter interstellar, we could go out to the Ord cloud. I calculated it'd take us 19 years to get, no, 190 years to get the Ord cloud, but who cares, you're going out that way. Anyway, so the answer is it's a lot. We did a bunch of studies and everything else. Anyway, so that's the talk about the revolution, how we need to take a different approach to go to space. It's that simple. And we're, we created a company, we're gonna go do it. We're working that. I'd say any questions, but we got the next speaker coming up. <laughs> Thank you.